Hello and thanks for joining us for another episode of Lifestyle Gardening. I'm Kim Todd and on today's program we'll be taking a look at tree and shrub health during the winter, community forestry and horticulture in western Nebraska. And we'll show you some new trends in house plants and succulents. Right now we'll start the program by hearing from Jody Green about what happens to insects during the cold Nebraska winter. may be wondering if all the insects are going to die because it's winter and it's cold outside. But insects have their own strategies to overwinter. Some, like the monarch butterfly and the painted lady butterfly, they take off for the winter. They're like snowbirds. They migrate to go to warmer places. And so do the green darner dragonflies. We saw a huge migration last fall, and so they actually leave the area when it's cold and they'll come back next spring. Other insects, they stay. They stay for the winter even though it's cold, but they have different strategies to spend the winter. Some of them will die, but they've left the offspring and they could be in the egg cases or in cocoons such as the bagworms that we have outside. Those little bags that are hanging on trees of all kinds this year, including the ones that they destroy, the evergreen trees, they are in the egg form. Some of those bags may be empty and some of them may be filled with up to 300 eggs. So we wanna pick those off. And there are other ways that insects spend the winter, including in their larval form. This is not very common, but we may see them if we dig up some leaf litter. The woolly bear caterpillar is one of the most famous known for having the ability to create a type of antifreeze in its body in the form of glycols, and that is how it can um, tolerate these freezing temperatures. They are usually under the leaf litter, and then they'll go into a cocoon phase and turn into a moth in the spring. So if you do happen to see one of those woolly bears crawling along the the ground, just tuck them back in so they can stay warm throughout the winter. The ones that avoid the cold are sometimes hiding under leaf litter, hiding in logs, in the bark of trees. Sometimes they do end up hiding in our chimneys and along our buildings, but the ones that we are dealing with on sunny days are ones that actually came in in the winter because they overwinter as adults inside. These include the brown marmorated stink bug, the western conifer seed bug, the multicolored Asian lady beetle, and box elder bug. They get in, on the, in the fall on warm sunny days. They crawl up the west side of the house. And so at this time, there's not much we can do about it. But just like us staying warm in our homes, we are avoiding the winter by sheltering. Some insects overwinter as larvae deep in the soil. If you think about the white grubs like the Japanese beetles, that's what they're doing right now, rather large and deep down into the soil. So no matter what, how cold it is, insects will survive. They find a way just like us. So stay warm and don't worry too much about those insects. Obviously, we deal with those insect pests all season long. So it's really interesting to hear how they survive our winters. I'm sure we'll have plenty to say once Backyard Farmer starts again in the spring. For this year's landscape lessons, we decided to help you with what's trending in the gardening world. And since you can't really do much outside right now, this week we're going to take a look at what's new, colorful, and exciting with houseplants and succulents. For our landscape lesson this year, what we're going to do a little bit is focus on the garden trends for 2020 and we introduced that in a previous show. One of the ones that is very, very important this year is house plants. And of course, that is a trend that started quite a few years ago. It is growing in popularity and it is really something that, that appeals to younger generations. One of the fun parts about that is we hear the term plant parrots. So young people who are perhaps both employed, they don't have children, they live in an urban environment, they're in an apartment or a small condominium or even a, a residence hall on a college campus, they can parent a plant as opposed to a puppy or even a guppy. 
And one of the things that they actually like about house plants is the foliage and the textures. That is another trend for 2020 that is really strong. And when we talk about foliage, we're talking about bold foliage in particular, and then the contrast that you can get with foliage plants. Whether it is the fiddle leaf fig with that great big foliage that can actually become a tree form, whether the vertical striped form of something like the old-fashioned mother's-in-law tongue, sago palm, you throw in crotons or you throw in bromeliads that have unusual textures and colors in the foliage, and that also then becomes a way for, for people who live in those spaces and like house plants to introduce color. So whether it's bold color or it is a little bit more subtle, that is a way to get color and the texture and the form in house plants without, of course, having to walk that puppy. One of the broad categories of house plants that has, of course, become wildly popular is succulents. And it just seems like one of those types of plants that the buying public cannot get enough of, probably for really good reasons, and that would be that they are come in so many unusual, interesting forms. They have great foliage. They can be a set it and forget it plant as long as you have the right light and you put them in those extremely well-drained gravelly mixes. The other beauty about succulents, of course, is that you can start small. So depending on your budget, this is actually not the smallest you can get, but you can get a very small one, give it a chance, put it in a container with a lot of larger ones so you immediately on your own patio or even in a nice sunny window in the house, you have a variety of textures and colors and forms. You create this little art form just using the succulents. And then of course, as they age, they grow, they get bigger, they turn into something that can be just absolutely amazing. Still succulents, but you've started small and you've watched that beautiful process of plants growing. Another interesting aspect of succulents, and some people like it and some people don't, is you get flowers on occasion, and they're pretty weird, but they give you a what is that if you're having guests over for dinner, if you have children. An easy one that many, many people are aware of, of course, is aloe, and aloe plants create pups, so you can become one of those gardeners or house plant plant parents who gives away the pups as perhaps a party favor if you have if you have a fabulous party at your house or good friends. And of course, if you really don't even want to take care of your succulents or any other house plants, the trend of bringing the outdoors in and the indoors out, you can buy succulents that are fake. There is so much variety out there for you to choose from when it comes to colors and textures, as well as, of course, that ease of care. You can easily find something interesting and fun if you visit your favorite garden center this time of year or look through those garden catalogs. Just remember to pay special attention to the care for instructions because just like the plants you grow outdoors, your house plants need different sorts of things to grow well. For today's interview, we're going to talk to community forestry specialist Chrissy Land with the Nebraska Forest Service. Chrissy is going to help us understand not only trees in western Nebraska, but the importance of special community gardens that can help any town's image and beauty. It's my pleasure to be talking to Chrissy Land, who is community forestry specialist in central to western Nebraska, with a little overlap there in the middle, about all things good, great, growing, and wind not blowing, right, in the western <laughs> part of the state, Chrissy. Pick a day when it's not. And the fun part about talking to you is you were a former design student, so you were originally from Scotts Bluff, came all the way across the state to get your degree, went all the way back, and now you are in a great position to be able to work both with private and public, or are you mostly working with public people at this point? You know, it's really shifted more to working with the public. Um, mm -hmm. It's kind of working with the different, you know, whether it's a garden club, a tree board, you know, either a city planner, um, just, just helping them sort of organize green spaces within the public grounds. So. so a different ball game than a single client because you've got a lot of people trying to stir the pot and put their two cents worth in. Yes. You know, Chrissy, one of the things that is 
both wonderful and really challenging about this state is the breadth, the width, the change in elevation, the change in climate, and of course that impacts the way the plants grow. Right. So from your experience, both growing up in that part of the state and now that you are actually working very closely with the plants, what have you seen that has changed in terms of what is doing well? And do you think that's an anomaly? Is that because of climate change? Is that drought, water? Right. What is that exactly? Yeah, there's definitely a lot of things that have really kind of caught my eye as I've transitioned over the last couple of years is, you know, I originally coming from more of the drier, you know, more sandy, higher pH soils and kind of moving into eastern Nebraska, you know, while I was studying and it's, I was shocked to see that soil and that was definitely kind of a game changer and then to kind of go back, you know, I really realized how much I loved working with the sandy soils, mm -hmm. but it's interesting because it, it seems like in the last couple of years, you know, we've had way more moisture than normal and we've had some kind of abnormal early snowfalls and so kind of some flash freezes happening. And so it's interesting, you know, whether that is an anomaly and it's gonna only happen maybe one or two more times or not, but we need to take those things into consideration when we're doing plant selection for the future. Um, right now, it doesn't seem like too many things are suffering terribly, but there's definitely more challenges coming with more moisture. We're seeing more insects, diseases, pests kind of show up. And so it's, you know, what is resistant? What isn't resistant? You know, what has the good genetics? What doesn't? So those are all great points because of course, one of the things that we should be doing is both understanding and then creating those resilient longer term landscapes. Also right. knowing that just like we, they have a lifespan, so we cannot right. expect set it, forget it. Right. So we were talking a little bit about specific plants that you like in combination and whether they are plants that we can recommend to our viewers pretty much statewide. You wanna talk right. about those for a little bit? Yeah, and that's one of my favorite things when I am looking at all the different gardens across the state is you know what combinations are really working well together. Mm -hmm. One of my favorite combinations that I've seen is actually in one of the downtown parking lots in Scotts Bluff and they've put in some liatris and some goldenrod. They've got some lead plant and then some butterfly milkweed with a little bit of some um, prairie drop seed and it's just, it's really kind of a showstopper when they all show up and they're kind of shining next to each other, some different structural, different textures and things. And really, I feel like those are some plants that you can really find all the way across the state. You know, um, if you don't find a garden with goldenrod and little blue stem <laughs> in it across the state, I would be kind of surprised. But, and if they're not in your garden, I would highly recommend them to be in your garden because they're definitely showstoppers. Well, they're native and we can also choose good cultivars or varieties of those natives. We had a little bit of a conversation about coneflower right. and the difference between our natives and some of the ones that are being promoted that may right. have problems. So talk about that for a second. Yeah, a couple, you know, we have our native, you know, the Echinacea pallida and, it, you know, the narrow, or not narrow leaf, the, is it narrow leaf? Mm -hmm. Okay, narrow leaf coneflower. And, you know, it, you can find it across the state, but one of my other favorite coneflowers that's more in production is the Cheyenne Spirit, you know, where it can start in one color, and then as it develops through the bloom, it'll go from, you know, a white to an orange to a yellow, and it just really, it, it can be found, I think, pretty much all the way across the state. Mm -hmm. But there's definitely, you know, those where we have the native, and then we have the more cultivated in the nursery, that they're developing. Excellent, so we have just a little bit of time left, but let's talk about the most important piece of the landscape, unless it's prairie, of course, and right. that would be the trees in those urban areas. A right. couple of favorites or ones that you're excited about in central and western Nebraska. Right, um, you know, one of the things that I think that we are, we have champions of is our pines. You know, we have great limber pines, our pinion pines, and our ponderosa, you know, you can find ponderosa growing in along, you know, more east towards the Missouri corridor, but the thing is, is you'll find it just really loving life in western Nebraska and more in its native range. Um, but otherwise, you know, for our communities, we have great trees like we have the catalpa, we have our hackberry, you know, some gamble oak, we have, you know, chinkapin oak, that's definitely one that 
is kind of being a little bit more paraded. And so it's, we, we have a, a large variety of different trees. Christy, that was great. Loving talking to you, especially hearing how your career is developing. And we will look forward to a few more questions from Western and Central Nebraska to Backyard Farmer and also your great uh, experience as you are seeing how those plants change. Yeah, thank you. It's so important to work with the community to help them understand the value of trees and public gardens. And since we don't often go west on our program, it's great to focus on how they deal with different environmental and climate conditions. Let's take a few minutes to hear answers to frequently asked questions. Our panelists from the regular Backyard Farmer program are joining us now to help you get some solutions to those everyday questions. Backyard Farmer is off the air right now. You can always send us those emails and that address is byf at unl.edu. You can also stay in touch with us by liking our Facebook page. Right now, let's hear from those panelists. So when it comes to winter mulch, what we want to do is we want to make sure that the ground is completely frozen, the plants are dormant before we put this winter mulch on. What the winter mulch does is it helps to regulate those temperature fluctuations that we see in Nebraska. Whether it's 60 degrees one day and 30 the next, we need that winter mulch to make sure that that plant stays dormant. And so the winter mulch usually is placed on in mid-November, and then what happens is, is we forget about it and we walk away and we go, well, I don't have to check it till next spring. But if we pack leaves and other materials around some of the, the perennials that we're trying to protect for winter and we walk away and we don't come back, oftentimes what we're gonna see is we're gonna see wildlife damage. We're gonna see tiny little voles that go in and they're gonna nip off the bark and completely girdle that tree. We can see rabbit damage as well. Another one, we can see some damage from actually deer and so what we want to do is we want to be vigilant. We want to be going out and checking that winter mulch. We need to make sure that it's up around that plant material enough that it helps to protect from those temperature fluctuations. But we also need to make sure that we go in and check the stems on a regular basis. If we're seeing those vole damage or we see that girdling of that bark around that stem, then we need to either try to control the voles, which Dennis would tell us how we need to control those voles, um, with the traps or with things along those lines. Also with rabbits, if we're going to be uh, around these plant materials, we need to make sure that we construct a rabbit fence. And this rabbit fence is also constructed high enough so those rabbits can't walk across the snow and then eat our plants that way. But this winter mulch can come off in the spring once that plant material begins to start to grow. The thing is, is we need to make sure that that winter mulch stays around that plant in case we have a temperature drop that we can put it back along that plant and protect it for that cold time. So some spring blooming trees that do well in Nebraska, certainly the, there's many crab apples that, uh, many selections of crab apples that do very well in Nebraska. You'll want to look at their disease resistance and most of the new ones that you'll find in the nursery are highly disease resistant. So you should have some good choices there. Uh, some plants that are native to this area, something like a redbud um, is another plant that does very well in Nebraska, um, kind of an iconic Southeast Nebraska uh, small tree. And again, seed source and where that plant came from, the plant has a long range, goes all the way down into Texas. And so you want to make sure that we're getting a northern seed source for that. But they do very well here. Uh, service berry is another plant that's very popular, uh, has good fall color, good fruit. Um, what birds really like the service berry. I like to eat service berry. So that's also a good choice. And again, placing that in a good location in your yard, that's one that I want to keep out of the late day sun. Uh, so there, there are a variety of things that you can look at. Even some of our, some of our small maples, uh, their, their flowers are maybe not quite as showy, but they do emerge with pretty leaves and they have a nice form. And, and so some of the smaller maples do well in the right place if you're looking for something that's kind of an understory tree. Uh, ironwood is another plant that, again, doesn't have a real showy flower, but they're unusual with their kind of hop 
uh, hop-like flowers and seeds that form and they have good fall color. So there's, there's a variety of things that do well for us um, and they also tolerate a variety of conditions. got a lot of phone calls asking about small red spots that are really just covering pear the or especially ornamental pears in, um, in Lincoln and really across Nebraska last year. Many of these spots were due to pear rust and pear rust is very similar to cedar apple rust, a little bit more common disease that we've been dealing with for quite a few years here in Nebraska. But pear rust is another one of our gymnosporangium rusts which means that in the spring Spores will develop on our cedar tree or on our juniper, and they'll form. There will be these small little galls, and when um, in late and early May, when um, when there is heavy moisture, there will be start to be orange globs that kind of form off of these galls. These orange globs are full of spores, and they're actually the telial spores of the of the rust fungus. With wind or rain splash, those spores can then trans can can be blown sometimes up to a mile onto a neighboring pear tree. Then once the then as the once those spores land on the pear leaves or on the pear fruit, then disease um, disease will continue on the pear throughout the season. And now the bet unfortunately the only time to control pear rust or the best time to control pear rust I should say is at the beginning of the season. And so right when those pear flowers are beginning to open. You may notice that the pear, the pear flowers are beginning to open right about the same time that some of our junipers are getting those nice orange globs of, of spores from some of our gymnosporangium rusts. What happens is those spores blow and they, and they infect through the flowers, causing a significant disease. And if you are looking for a chemical control option, really at bud break um, or at when those flowers are opening is the best time to control any of our any of our gymnosporangium rusts or pear rusts. Additionally, later in the season, if you if you did, especially if you missed that early season spring um, fungicide application, other sanitation that we can do can prevent success, can re, can prevent more infection on the trees. And so making sure that we are removing some of the fallen leaves that are severely infected, or if we're getting a fruit infection, making sure that we're removing those and destroying them can greatly reduce disease pressure. We do hope you're benefiting from the expertise of our panelists in these areas that are common problems for most of our gardening folks here in the state. And we'll hear more from them next time around. As we finish up today's program, we're going to turn your attention to trees and shrubs in the winter. Understanding tree and shrub growth patterns, insect and disease pests are things you're going to need to know in order to keep them growing vigorously. And there are some simple ways to identify what you have so you will be more prepared to take care of them. about how important it is that you know what kind of plant material you're dealing with in your landscape. It's important for all sorts of reasons, how that plant will grow, what kinds of insects and pests, and all sorts of other diseases it might get. It's also important so that you know what you're dealing with in terms of its growth rate and its habit. So let's talk a little bit about deciduous trees and shrubs and how to differentiate between them, especially in winter condition. First start by knowing whether it is a tree or a shrub and that sounds a little bit silly, but we have some shrub-like trees and some tree-like shrubs. That's a good designation or differentiation to begin with. Then what we look at is the overall form of that tree. It's going to be different when it's young, and of course, if it's well-grown, if it's been managed properly, it will be a different sort of a tree than it would be if it was on its own in the forest or really has had very little care. We look then at the arrangement of the buds on the branches. Are they alternate or are they opposite? That is a really key identification factor with deciduous trees and shrubs. It can be a little bit tricky on some that want to kind of change their minds or be a little bit subalternate or subopposite or whorled. But in general, that is one of the very first things we look at, especially if you don't have any foliage. Remember that the foliage can blow all over the place in the winter 
You might have leaves of an oak under an ash or leaves of a maple under a linden, and that can throw you off track if you're not looking at those other clues. We also then look at whether we have something that is called the terminal bud, and what does that terminal bud look like? In the case of oaks, as an example, they're clustered terminal buds. Beech, it is a single terminal bud, and then the axillary buds look just like the other ones, but point in different directions. Of course, with shrubs, we don't have that big massive trunk or the scaffold branches, but we still have some of the same characteristics that we use for identification. A lot of people think of shrubs as just a vase or a round meatball, and they all look the same. If you start with those same sorts of identification characteristics, which is the form to begin with, as, although sometimes they've been pruned into forms that you can't recognize, but then we go to the structure and the arrangement of the foliage, opposite or alternate. That still applies with shrubs, and oftentimes with shrubs, one of the things you will see first in the winter months is those terminal floral buds, which were set on previous year's wood. Viburnums are a great example of that because you can differentiate between the vegetative buds and the floral buds, and that can help with identification. Again, you may also be able to see either the fruit itself, if it's still remaining, or the remains of that fruit, where the fruit was placed on the plant. That can also help with identification of shrubs. So it's really the same principles in terms of taking a look at what the form of the plant is, whether it's a tree or a shrub. Shrubs typically do not have a single trunk and they are not big massive plants. Trees typically do have a big trunk and they are a single stem or maybe a multi-stem. Then we look at whether the leaf arrangement is opposite or alternate. We pay attention to the buds and the bud structure and that at least gets us a little bit down the road to be able to identify trees and shrubs in winter condition. Those identification keys are the first step in caring for your trees and shrubs. All of this good information will help you make better decisions and keep them growing for years to come. Thanks again for joining us for Lifestyle Gardening. Next time we'll continue looking at garden trends and best practices for turf weed control. Don't forget to check us out on Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter. So good morning, good gardening, thanks for watching. We'll see you all next time on Lifestyle Gardening.